Um, Ani, kikere we are. Ke wait no longer do in Krishna Kas, chichakan do them. Nipe sing in Don Juba, Nishna Ben in Indo, Kinamagin in Indo. In English, yeah, it's Andrew McConnell. Um, my name in Nishnabe is uh, Giwed Nonganu, which I said at the beginning. Um, told you my clan, I'm Kijuk. Um, similar concept of clan. Uh, you probably know the word. You've probably heard the word totem. And uh, that's, that's, that's our word, specifically Nishnabe folk. That's our word for clan. And it's a reference back to our family. Uh, my family is from Nipissing First Nation, so, you know, Sheila, you might have a concept of where Nipissing is in relationship to Toronto, um, <clears throat> but that's that's where my family, I have family members who live there. I live in Toronto, which is about three and a half hours south, and yes, I know in Europe, you actually measure things by kilometers, in Canada, we measure by time, um, so if I say it's three and a half hours away, I have no idea how long that is in kilometers, I just know that I get in the car I drive for three and a half and I'm there. <laughs> um, yeah, I am currently the coordinator of Indigenous Programming at the York Region District School Board, um, which again, it's an interesting role, like <laughs> that whole conversation you folks had about having an artifact, coming back, finding it, concern about losing it forever. I mean, that whole thing to me was really interesting because um, even the talk about, I, I got the sense that you were talking about the restarting of a tradition something that had existed, had gone away for a while and you're bringing it back. And very much for those of us who are here, there's a lot of that going on. Um, there's a lot of rekindling a tradition, talking about, you know, yeah, the, the story of the seven fires. Um, and actually it's a part of the seven fires. Um, so I guess when I tell that story, then I'll come out, but um, just, just understand that this is very much a common occurrence. Um, and, and specifically here in Ontario, it's something that's going on in ways that I never thought would happen in my lifetime. Um, so it is, it, is, it is an interesting time to be Anishinaabe here in Ontario. That said, Ontario itself, as much as it's an Indigenous word, it's not an Anishinaabe word, it's actually um, a Haudenosaunee word. Uh, and if you know anything about any of the nations that were here, very often they got referred to as the Iroquois, um, but Haudenosaunee is the proper word that they use for themselves. Um, and before I get to seventh fire, I'm gonna talk about the three fires. Because um, that'll help you to understand who I am as an Anishinaabe person. So as an Anishinaabe person, I'm um, Nipissing is my home community. That's where my my grandmother was born. My dad grew up just off reserve. Um, I grew up farther away. In Nipissing, we are what's known as Ojibwe. So if you've ever heard of Ojibwe or Chippewa, I'm one of those. Um, and so that's known as one of the fires of the Three Fire Confederacy of the Anishinaabe people. Um, the other two fires are the Potawatomi. Um, again, they speak a dialect of Anishinaabe. And then the other one is the Odawa. And they're also known as one of the fires. And, um, and they speak Anishinaabe as well. Just again, it's a slightly different dialect. It's kind of like been through Scotland. It's like thinking Ouija versus Edinburgh versus uh, Inverness, right? <laughs> Mutually intelligible, but has its own words and ways of speaking, right? So um, it's that kind of concept. Um, that said, I mean, the area that we that we cover is massive. Um, if you've ever seen the Great Lakes and you've looked at the Great Lakes, we are basically everything along the north shores of all of the Great Lakes down into um, some of the states uh, like Michigan, which, by the way, is it's that's an Anishinaabe word. It means a big lake. Um, if you come down into, you know, um, Wisconsin, that's that mean that refers to an open field. You've all heard of Chicago, right? So Chicago means a little onion, um, just so you know. <laughs> so uh, Chicago, it goes in your soup. Um, so again, we'll probably come back and talk a lot about language at some point, because there's just some, some really interesting pieces that'll go back and forth. Things that have come from Scotland that have influenced people's perceptions of what is traditional here. Um, there's, there's a couple of those in there. But yeah, so if if you know somebody who's Anishinaabe, like I am, um, we we do refer to ourselves as the Three Fire Confederacy because we acknowledge that we are three groups of people that speak a common language and have banded together when necessary to, um, to take care of each other. And that really is, um, fire has a really key meaning within our culture around care. Um, it's at the center of the home. 
Um, in fact, even within the word for fire, which is uh, shkode, um, at the end of it, you get the word ode, and ode literally means heart. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the word for town <laughs> or village is odenang. So it's the place where your heart is. Um, so it's all in there, right? So shkode is a, is a, it's a really important concept because um, it has to do with your family. Right. You know, we, we lived in small family groups. Uh, we're not like the Haudenosaunee who lives in longhouses. We lived in our own homes. You know, we we've original single family dwelling. Um, and so the fire would always be at the middle of that dwelling. And um, and then when it comes to ceremony or any large gatherings, we'll put down a larger fire. And that's put together in a particular way um, using, you know, a couple of particular medicines. Um, and I'm using kind of, I'm going to use medicine, which I know is an English word, but I'm using it in the context of Nishinaabe, uh, which is, it's uh, mishkik, and which literally means strength of the earth. So all of our medicines, we're talking about plants. Um, but when we're putting together um, a fire for a ceremony, it's usually called a sacred fire, and it has to be taken care of. Uh, if you start a fire at the beginning of a ceremony, someone has to care for it until the ceremony is over, and then you put the fire out. So it's actually a point of responsibility. And um, it's usually a point of responsibility for men uh, to care for the fire. Um, and we do actually still get people reaching out uh, for it's going to be a ceremony. They'll reach out to have a couple of fire keepers uh, to make sure that somebody's there to do it. And they'll be cared for by others because their job is to feed the fire. It's somebody else's job to feed them while they are doing that because they won't leave the fire. Um, we had a powwow here uh, in October. And uh, there's a gentleman who came down to, to be the, the main fire keeper. And again, he was passing that job on to other folks who would do it, but he was the main fire keeper. And that was their responsibility is just to make sure that that fire started before the powwow began. <clears throat> what it started with the prayers, similar to how you folks started today. Um, and at the end, um, there's always a closing prayer. We always close things because uh, we, we, see, we see the world is working in a circle. Of course, it is a circle. Um, so when you start with an opening and you come back around, you come back and you do a closing. Um, and that is when we'll generally put out the fire. Uh, again, it's it's a it depends on the level of ceremony you're stepping into as to what you're going to do and how you're going to work with that fire. Um, but even those pieces like, um, and I didn't bring it today. If I were to bring my full bundle with me, uh, I would actually have my fire kit. Um, I would have those things that I need to make a fire. Um, and funny enough, I do have flint and steel in there which is interesting because um, traditionally we had flint. <laughs> we don't have steel. Uh, we were not known as great steel makers. So again, we wouldn't have used flint and steel to, to start a fire where we have a different way of doing it with sticks, which works by the way, it works really well. When you get good at it, it's a piece of cake. Um, if you don't do it very often, then you're not gonna do it. Um, and again, ideas like that have changed within our language, right? Like shkodans, uh, or Shkodans is a little fire, that's that's a match, right? Um, Shkodebik refers to something that makes fire or holds fire, Shkodebik, and that's that's a lighter, which funny enough, and I don't think you get Bic lighters in Scotland, but here we get Bic lighter, we have the Bic lighter, and so it's always, it's one of the biggest like running jokes in Ojibwe, it's like, I got Shkodebik, they'll hold up their Bic. <laughs> So, so those things, you know, those those are the crossovers of culture. And there we go. See, yeah, shkode bik. If you heard shkode bik, um, that's the way the language works. It's very cool, and it does that sort of piece. Um, so yeah, Sheila, you asked me about the, the 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 prophecy or the story of the seven fires, and this is this is really interesting because it's sacred but not sacred. It's not like that level of I wouldn't be doing this here. Um, but it is, a, it, is, it, is, it is a request. And it's funny because um, normally if somebody were to ask me to do this, I would expect to get tobacco. And that's, and which is impossible in this situation, right? You're there, I'm here, it's not gonna happen. So don't worry, but I, I have my own, by the way, I'm holding my tobacco. Because um, everything we do when, it, when it's serious work starts with tobacco. Um, if we take something off the land, we leave tobacco. Um, when we do our morning sort of, some people call it a sunrise ceremony, but if you're saying your prayers, giving your thanks for the sun came up again, again, we're big on fire. Like we're huge on fire, right? Like we acknowledge the sun is the original fire. Um, when that comes up, we'll put down our tobacco in the morning and say, thanks. 
Um, same, same being, same creator. Um, it's just, you know, it's Gijimanado, great spirit as opposed to God, right? Same process, same thought pattern, same reference to everything else um, in those particular pieces. But, um, you know, really when we're thinking about those things and when we start, it's always about starting in a good way and we start with tobacco. Because for us, that's where the story comes from. It's uh, everything starts with tobacco. So as far as the seven fires goes, um, I'm going to go back to where I first heard it. And so I was born in the 70s. Um, and so as much as I was born knowing I was Native, as much as I was born knowing I was Nipissing, as much as I was, I grew up knowing I was Ojibwe, um, I was born at a time when culture wasn't out front. Um, if to give you a sense and understanding, uh, all of our ceremonies were illegal until 1951. Um, that is when we got back the rights to actually start holding ceremonies. And if you think about how hard I would assume it was for you to kind of resuscitate some of the ceremonies that you had lost or had set aside for this group, um, imagine if it was illegal and imagine if it was lost in some families, what would you have to go through to start those processes again? And it it's taken a couple of generations to get these things back. Luckily, a lot of our ceremonies and cultures kind of went underground. Um, but what it meant was that even from that period from 50 until 72 when I was born, a lot of those things were still being kept underground because if there's one thing we learned for the 100 years when things were illegal, we didn't trust the government. Um, and we didn't trust all the organizations attached to the government um, because they use those things to do all sorts of things to us. And I'm not going to get into all of that today. Um, just understand that it's been a long time coming. So I actually didn't hear the story of the seven fires until I was, I was 20. Yeah, I was 20. And I went to uh, an event called an elders conference. And uh, there was a gentleman there who was, he did the story. He did a story around the medicine wheel, talked about the colors. Um, thankfully, he was Ojibwe because, again, in an elders conference, you get people from many different cultures, uh, which is good. You learn from different cultures, but sometimes you don't learn your own. Um, and so it was important for me that when I was there that I got to listen to somebody who was Ojibwe kind of give this story. And um, I, was, I was kind of enraptured because, again, for me, education was I got to learn about things from England. That's the reality of it. Um, I teach in an education system that's based on the Victorian model. Um, and it basically it's colonialism 101. Nobody sees it. They don't understand it. I have to remind people that we teach in English, which is a foreign language here, because um, this isn't England. <laughs> and, and they have to, you can see it, people have to process that for a second. I'm like, domestic languages, Nishnabe Moin or Ganagayaga, like those are the domestic languages, not English. You know, not even French, right? So, and the funny thing is that where I am specifically, French was spoken by Europeans first. Then English showed up later. Um, this was the territory where the French came through first. So when I got to hear this story, um, it was a big deal um, for me. Because again, it was somebody I wasn't related to delivering story. Because up to that point, all of my, what I knew about being native came through my family. Um, that was a big deal for me. It was really interesting. And it also kind of gave me a sense of purpose and placed me sort of in line of where I am in relationship with all of those who came before me. And now we're going to come back to that, that concept because the number seven is really important. Um, it, it exists in several indigenous cultures, specifically in Ojibwe, it does a couple of things. And all of a sudden I'm kicking myself because there was a word I was supposed to look up and I didn't look it up. And so it's going to bug me for the rest of the day, but whatever. Um, the story of the seven fires goes like this. There was a time, quite some time ago, where there was a, a council fire, because we do everything at fire. Um, councils take long periods of time. That's why there's a fire. You're gonna be you're gonna be there, you know, from sun up to sundown and beyond. So you might as well have a fire. Um, it's warm, gives you light, you can talk for a long period of time. So the story goes that there was a council fire, people from many communities meeting. And they were talking about what was going to come up in the next year, things that they were going to do, how they were going to plan forward. And there was a bit of a commotion outside the lodge. Um, and this would have been a big lodge. Like, we're not talking, don't forget TP, forget Wigwam. I'm talking like a large building that would have been constructed for this. Um, and, and a man was brought in from outside. And the way the story was originally described to me was, you know, he was kind of disheveled, looked a little bit, you know, sort of 
off, um, was a little rough around the edges, um, which again, at a formal gathering like this wouldn't be, wouldn't be normal, right? It would be like showing up at the party in your work clothes. <clears throat> but, you know, he came in and he had an important message to deliver. So everybody was around the fire. They gave him space and they let him talk. And he came and he says, I have, I have an important message for you. He says, I've had a vision. I've, I've seen it now clearly. He says, I need to give this to you because it's so important. And he said, um, we're coming into a time of great change. And um, in my dream, I've seen seven fires. Um, and these seven fires are the next seven generations. And he said, we are in the time of the first fire, uh, which will be the last time when we will be ourselves. And he said, we're going to go through a dark time where the fires are going to grow dim. And he said, you know, with the second fire, there'll be the arrival of a new people. And they will come saying one thing, but they will do something else. And in the time of the third fire, those people will start to uh, influence how we conduct ourselves. And we will lose ourselves more and the fires will dim more. And then he said, you know, in the, in the time of the next fire, um, they will take over control of our fires. Uh, they will make it hard for us to... They will make it hard for us to, to maintain our fire as it is, and they will try to replace it with their own. And we will see that same pressure in the time of the fifth fire, um, where it will seem like that will be it and will be snuffed out. So, but then we will start to grow strong again. And in the time of the sixth fire, we will start to see things come back to us. And we will start to recover those things that we had, because some of us will have maintained that fire, as though it might have been dimmed. We will have been able to pass it from person to person to person. Because we all know that's how fire works, right? You can light it in one place. And with that candle, right, you can take it somewhere else and pass it to a new person, pass it to another individual. Um, and he said, that will happen. He said, but the time of the seventh fire, um, that will be significant. The time of the seventh fire when, is when we will come into a rebirth and we will start to see our own comeback. Um, and we will start to see us come back to our own and we'll rekindle it and see a rising again of those flames. And the people will know what it is. We'll be able to come back and sit around it and find that warmth, just like we all are tonight. And to really get a sense again of who it is that we are, because that fire has been passed forward by person to person to person to person to person. He says that time of the seventh fire, you'll know it because that's when the eagle will fly its highest. And we're big on eagles, by the way, like really big on eagles. Um, he says, that's when the time when the eagle will fly its absolute highest. And he said, that is when you will know it's the time of the seventh fire. And that's when you'll know it is the time to be safe to bring back the culture. Because we will be back in control of who we are and, and what we bring to this world. And so, you know, they spent a long time. They talked around that thing. And they, 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 they had heard the man. And he stayed. They fed him, gave him water. And they talked around it a bit more. And really the decision was made was that, you know, it is our role as the time of the first fire to really think seven generations ahead to make sure that what we do is to prepare all of the future generations to know what it is to be us and to carry that package forward carefully um, and to move it on to the next person, the next person, the next person. I know, Sheila, you've got the book of uh, uh, Edward Benet Smith, right? Um, and uh, I know in there they talk about the scrolls, right? Um, and that would have been the time when they made the decision to hide the scrolls. Um, and so we have actually the old stories. Um, the way we used to collect stories was that there would be a visual component that goes with the story and then an oral component. Um, so not the same sort of writing of a novel like you get, but again, describing of a story using imagery and then somebody being taught what do each, what does each image mean and passing that along. So those things exist, um, Sheila. The scrolls are real. Um, they've been seen and published. Um, a couple of the books that published them are now out of print, but I've seen the books that were published. Uh, the funny thing is that, again, it's not enough to have the pictures. You have to sit with the person who carries the story and can explain what the picture means. Um, that's important. But those things exist. Well, those were put away then. Um, and it's significant that I'm telling you that because like I told you, they exist, they've been brought out, they've been put away and they've been brought out. Um, and they sit in the possession, there's, there's versions of them, they sit in the possessions of real people these days. 
They talked about that and they made their plans. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that we maintain the fire and hold on to those things that are important. And we're going to pass those on, you know, parent to child, grandparent to grandchild, great grandparent to great grandchild. It's so important that that line continues because they knew we were going to have to come back in the time of the seventh fire. Now, after they had all talked about that, the, the, the guy who'd come in, the crazy, I, I don't want, I don't want to say crazy because he wasn't crazy. He was prescient, but uh, you know, when people show up, you know, with dreams, anybody tends to wonder, it's like, okay, now what are we hearing? <laughs> but um, the man said, he says, there's, there's one more part to the story that's really important for you. And he said, at the end of the eighth fire, the eighth fire will rekindle the, sorry, at the end of the seventh fire, you'll get the kindling of the eighth fire, the eighth generation. He said, this will be a time of um, significance. And what he said was, at that point, we will have brought forward to the seventh fire all of our teachings. We will have be, be strong enough and capable enough and in a relationship with the new people um, to be able to speak on our own and to speak out loud and to give them the teachings that we have about how to live. And really, that's that's what it means to be an Ishnabe. It's about how you live. It's not even what you look like. Because, I mean, I know so my mom's, my mom's parents are English. So I'm half English. Uh, one grandparent came from Birmingham. One came from um, uh, Manchester. That gives you a sense of where my mom's family is from. My dad's family is from here. Um, except for the Irishman. That's how I got a McConnell last name, right? So there's an Irishman in there somewhere. <laughs> um, when you meet native people over here, um, we never look the way people expect us to, right? Because they're looking for Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood never got it right. They know how to sell a good story. They just don't know how to get it right. <laughs> um, Braveheart, right? So uh, <laughs> I knew I'd get you all with that one. Um, so, so, you know, again, that's where you get an Australian to bring them. <laughs> happens to us all the time they always get an asian person or an italian or somebody else to stand in for one of us um but uh i'll get back to the eight fire basically the point was is at this point we will have told everybody in this generation how to live a good life and they'll make a choice they will either continue to live their own way and on that is the pathway to destruction or they will choose to live the way we do in relationship with everything around us. And at that point, with that kindling of the eighth fire, we'll finally see a rebirth of all peoples as one moving forward in a good way, living in full relationship, not just with each other, but with everything around us, the way we're supposed to under, we, we often refer to it as original instructions. Um, and so here's the cool piece. So again, on that day, this is, I swear, like 25, 27 years ago, I heard that story. And the, the gentleman brought forward at that time, he said, you know, the, the thing that he looked to, he said, for knowing it was the time of the seventh fire, he said, uh, two things happened in 1969. First of all, man landed on the moon. And of course, the message that came back from the moon was the eagle has landed. He said, significantly, though, what happened here in Canada was at the first um, detox and addiction centers for Indigenous people by Indigenous people opened. And that is the significance because that's a sign of Indigenous people looking after their own, which it's funny. There's often this debate here within conservative circles saying, you know, Indigenous people should take care of themselves without anybody asking the question of, do we let them? And prior to that time, we were not allowed to do for ourselves. Um, what came next was not only did we start taking care of ourselves for healing our own wounds, um, we started taking over our own education system. 72 was the Assembly of First Nations called for Indian education by Indians. Um, that's where, Sheila, you saw, you, you've probably heard of residential school. That's where you saw the transfer of control of various residential schools slowly across the country to the control of First Nations. Um, and you start to see this long process. And of course, like I told you, I was born in 72. There wasn't a lot of public culture. It's 2020. I, it's everywhere. It's all over the place. I grew up in and around the Toronto area. There wasn't a single sign of anything that was Indigenous. If you come to Toronto and you go to City Hall today, there's a huge medicine wheel 
right with the sign that says Toronto. Um, and literally when that thing was put up five years ago, I was down there with my own son and I said, this is what it is. This is ours. This is what it means. And I could do a teaching from it at that time. Um, that wasn't around when I was a kid. And if you think about it, um, that would kind of tell you that I was born in the time of the seventh fire. Um, in that time of the rekindling of the rebirth, the retelling of stories, the learning of language, I introduced myself to you all in Ojibwe, uh, which is significant because the last fluid, fluent speaker in my family is my grandmother. She was born into a family that only spoke Ojibwe. She was sent to school away from home did not speak it in the language when she came home, even though she could speak it because it's the only one her, her mother spoke and she taught her kids English. Um, therefore, when I was being raised, um, we didn't speak Ojibwe in the house. And again, that's significant because it's not like I live in a foreign country, right? I live in the land of Ojibwe folk. Like that is the language of the land. Um, right down to, I said, you know, there's a couple of names like Michigan, you've heard of Chicago, you know, Wisconsin. Um, there's many more names. Um, all over the place. Ottawa, I, you might have heard of the capital of Canada being Ottawa. I mentioned that one of the three nations, one of the three fires is Odawa. That's the proper pronunciation of Ottawa. It's Odawa. That's where the, that's where the accent goes. Um, so we're all over the place. Even Quebec, the name Quebec is a Jivoy, it means closed off. Um, so, you know, all of those things are there. Um, so it's significant that through my life, these things have reawakened, reopened um, to the point where my son was taking uh, Nishtambe Moin, which is Ojibwe language courses online with a teacher from Serpent River, again, making connections to community in good ways. Um, both of my children have their name in Ojibwe. I didn't have it until much later in life. They've had it since they were little. Um, and they both know what it means and they carry it very well. Well, they both also have an English name and an Italian name because my wife's Italian. Um, again, where you come from is important. It matters. It kind of dictates, you know, because while well, you might be walking around in the earth of a different place, you carry the DNA from somewhere else. Um, and it matters because um, there was there's a reason why that DNA came about to be. Um, and so you bring that forward with a bit of a bit of sense of understanding of I belong to something. But that's kind of where we are at the time of the eighth fire, this time where the rest of the world has to listen to how we live. And you can see it, a lot of indigenous nations all over the world are kind of standing up and saying, you can't use land, water and air the way you do and expect to survive. Um, you know, it gets it gets called the environmentalism movement in a lot of um, a lot of other cultures. The word environmentalism doesn't even exist in Ojibwe. Like we didn't need it. It's actually fundamental to our existence. Um, the word for us is mino uh, bamadzuin, which literally translates as living in a good way. Um, and we're very big on teaching that to our kids, right? It's not about what you have. What you have is secondary. Um, because the fact of the matter is we look to the world for everything we have. Therefore, if you need something, it's, it grows out. It's right there. If you think back to how we used to make our houses, if you got a hole in the roof, you walked outside, you got some more birch bark, you put it on the roof, you solved the hole, right? It's There's no Home Depot. It grew outside because you took care of the tree. <laughs> and that's why you have to take care of these things because the resources are right there. Why do you care for the fish? Well, because you don't care for the fish. They're gone. You're not going to eat, right? Um, you probably hear these concepts of, uh, you know, only... You know, a lot of people like to talk about how we would use all parts of the animal, which is funny because every culture actually does that. Um, you know, it's just that it wasn't just that we used every part of the animal. Uh, we only took the animal that we needed in that moment. There is no hoarding. Uh, we're pretty much anti-Hobbs, right? The idea that the only way to protect your, your existence is to take so that nobody else takes it. Where we're like, it's a self-sustaining system. As long as you don't screw it up, it'll be there. Um, it even goes back to our creation story, right? We acknowledge that we are the last part of creation. That's, yeah, am I okay? Uh, let's come back. Am I here? Oh, no. Don't worry. You've got everybody else. Is everybody frozen? Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. 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 Unstable uh -huh. internet connection. 
I'll test. I'll keep going. Okay, test one, two, three. Yeah, yeah. 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 There you go. It's okay. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm still in the same land. <laughs> <laughs> um, where was I? Give me, give me a quick word back. Last thing I said. So you just said about uh, fish maintaining. That's fish. right. Yeah. yeah. Right. If you eliminate the fish, you got nothing to eat. Therefore, you doom yourself. That's right. So here's where I come to it. In our creation story, which is similar to the creation story in the Bible, people come last. Everything else came first. You can take that as a point of hubris. I'm the last. I'm the best. Or you can really take it as a point of humility, which is everything else existed before I showed up. Nothing else requires my existence. I, on the other hand, require everything else to live. That's that's what Minabamadzwin is. That's what it means to live a good life. Um, and that's that sense of those fires. Again, another reason why I tend to believe in the prophecy, um, it's generations, right? And again, this is going to be fun with the dates. You guys were talking about dates as we got here, and I'm, I'm just loving it. Um, so I'm the seventh generation since the signing of the treaty for my area. So my seven removed grandfather, seven generations before me, his name was Michael Shabagizik. He signed the treaty for Nipissing. Uh, he was one of 10 signatories for, you can look it up, there's a treaty out there called the um, Williams-Huron or the yeah, Williams-Huron Treaty. Uh, it was signed in 1850. So that's my ancestor who signed that for us. Um, so I'm seven generations removed. If you look at the map from 1850, the area around Nipissing, all along the North Shore of Lake Huron, you will not see settlement. It's settled. There's lots and lots of Anishinaabe people living there. But as far as you're concerned, you won't see what you, what you traditionally know as British settle, settlements, at least over here, right? Um, I've been through England and Scotland, like I said, you guys, to trying to find a straight road over there is pretty difficult. But over here, there's straight roads everywhere, right? They put straight roads everywhere. Um, and so that's that's your first sign of settlement. If you look at the map in 1850, you won't find any of those north of Lake Nipissing and Lake Huron. Um, that's significant, right? Because until he signed that treaty, um, those lands were ours. In fact, on most maps, it'll say Indian land or Indian territory. So part of that deal was that we were supposed to get annuities. Um, because they were signing away our land. And um, this will be the last thing I'll talk about when you think about fire and how you think seven generations forward. Um, so all the chiefs who signed that, they signed for annuities and it was $2 per person in the community, right? It was about 25 years later where they realized there's this thing called inflation. Because inflation doesn't exist if you live off the land. That's a money thing. Right? How much, how much is a fish worth? It depends on how, if you're starving or not, right? That's what it's about. And of course, if there's plenty of fish, well, we're not bartering over fish, right? That sort of thing. Um, so they realize there's this thing called inflation. Two bucks doesn't go as far. They upped it to $4. The last time they did it was 1875. So we all still get $4 a year. If you know anything about land value, and the money that governments make off of land, you know, we're not getting a fair shake. Um, so when you look up 1850 and you look up here on here on Robinson Treaty, you'll also notice that we took Canada to court um, and we won. <laughs> but of course, they're they're appealing to their system, their courts, not ours. You, you know, we don't trust it that much. Um, but anyways, I still go and collect my treaty money because to me, it's a point, it's a point of, if we don't collect it, they'll say, look, you don't even want it anyways. Even though $4, that barely buys a coffee now. <laughs> so I went down the last time they were doing it here in Toronto. Um, normally you have to go back to your community. My community is three and a half hours away. Um, there was one time they did it in Toronto. So I went and picked it up. I got like $36 because I, I collected several years worth. That felt sizable. And then I asked, I went, can I get my kids treaty money? Because my kids weren't with me. I, they, they were at school that day. I was off. Um, and the, the guy said, yeah, sure. What's their name? Same last name. I went, yeah, it's my children, same last name. He looked them up and I got, you know, I got, uh, I got $8 for one kid and $8 for the other. Because uh, they'd only had their status for two years. That's a whole other thing. You, you can't be born an Indian 
you have to apply to be an Indian. It, it's, it's wonderful. Trust me, the way the government works, it's incredible. Um, so, so I got $8 for one kid, $8 for another, and I went home. And this is where that whole seven generation comes in. Uh, my daughter, she walked in from school. I went, here, this is yours. And I gave her, I gave her $8. And she looks at me and she says, what is this? I went, well, it's your treaty money. You know, you got it for that. She says, why do we get it? And I had one of those pauses for a second and just, you know, the idea kind of popped in the back of my head. I said, because your ancestor knew um, seven generations ago, eight generations ago that you would be here. And that what he was doing that day was that he was signing away your right to those lands that had sustained him and all the generations before. And that he wanted to make sure that you had something to take care of you because he knew you were going to be here. And that's one of the fundamental teachings of the seven generations with us is that any decision you make must be made within the concept of not only what does it do for me and my children and my grandchildren, but what will it do for all of my relations seven generations into the future? And that's, that's where those pieces kind of all click back to me for the seven fire prophecy. I don't know if the guy actually came in. I don't know if the council went in. All I know is that the teaching makes sense. It works. And it gives me a sense of purpose for all those things that I'm supposed to do in my generation, which is take these stories forward in a good way, follow our traditions, do things to the best of my abilities I can in our way, um, and to relate to others in a good way, not so that they will become like me, but so that they can be themselves and that I can be me and that we can work together and hopefully get that promise of the eighth fire, which is living in a good way uh, for all of us in all spaces. So there you go. I told you, Sheila, all you gotta do is wind me up and then let me go. <laughs> uh -huh. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Just putting away my tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> are you happy to take questions if anyone has? I'm very happy to take questions. Again, this is up to you folks. I'm it's I'm here for a while. <laughs> the traffic doesn't get bad for another hour. <laughs> so has anyone got any questions? Please raise your hand either in person or on video. How how do you feel getting that that four dollars a year does it does it feel like your ancestors are looking after you or does That's it feel cool. that you've been conned out of something um so the four dollars says my ancestor was looking after me and it lays out that i have a challenge with the current um, ancestors of those folks we made the deal with to hold them accountable um so it gives you purpose um like i said <laughs> my my communities so we do, so we hold lands collectively. We also hold money from lands collectively. Um, so I'm in full support of our monies being used to take Canada and Ontario to court. Um, and knowing that that, that court settlement, that we, so we, like I said, we won the court case. It's Ontario that's appealing. Canada has decided to negotiate over renewed annuities. Um, and the other thing is we're also realists. So, so um, we don't, we don't think of ourselves as Canadian, but we live in relationship with Canada. It's like, it's, it's an actual physical thing. It's not going anywhere. Um, so like when we talk about ideas of like restitution, it's like, I'm a realist. Canada can't pay us back. It would bankrupt the nation. Um, it's just gonna have to be about like, you know, what can we do in a good way that will help us look after ourselves? Cause that's the whole point. The signing of the treaty and the annuities was so that we didn't have to rely upon anybody else to look after ourselves. Um, I'm part of Nipissing First Nation. We're actually in the process of coming out of the Indian Act. And the Indian Act is the piece of legislation that exists in Canada that governs us. And it's only us. And yeah, it's racist. It's sexist. Um, but it's the only piece of legislation that guarantees our treaty rights. Um, so nations are choosing to come out only when they have a set deal with Canada and whatever province they happen to be tied to. Uh, because Canada has responsibility for relationships with First Nations. The provinces have responsibility for the land. And of course, we're like, we are the land. <laughs> like, like, that's actually what defines us. And I mean, it's funny how hard that is for Canadians to get. Europeans understand it like that. 
because you all live on your lands. <laughs> um, but for people who are here, they've, especially for folks who are two or three generations removed, right? People who are newly immigrated to Canada, they have a strong tie and connection to a piece of land somewhere else in the world. For people who are born here, they have a strong tie to this land, but a culture from somewhere else. And that's where the disconnect sometimes kicks in, right? Um, you know, and, and yet still we have lots to teach each other, right? Like we follow a lunar calendar. So I find, you know, a lot of the Asian traditions that I currently want, we just went through New Year's here, right? Um, you know, I, I find it fascinating because we also follow a lunar calendar. Um, of course, our names for the moons are totally tied to what's happening. Right, like we're this is moon of crusted snow right now, um, because and Sheila knows this. Like the snow is on the ground; it's got a hard crust on it. It's I I, I hate this snow. I hate it. Um, but the next moon is um, Sweetwater, and and Sheila, you know why it's called Sweetwater? Again, I'm testing your Canadian this year, right? <laughs> what starts? What happens in March? Uh, is it the Quebec festival you put the maple syrup on the, on the snow? There you go. Sweet water. The sap starts to run, right? Uh, the, maple, the maple sap will start running, and that's when we would leave our winter camps and settle in our spring camps, and we do our collection of uh, maple syrup for the year. Um, we only have two sources of sugar here traditionally, right? One is maple syrup. The other one is honey. And so we'd be getting our maple syrup. This is where we're getting our big boost of uh, sugar because we would have run out of sugar over the winter. Um, and so we do all that collection. And then after the maple syrup's done, um, we get strawberry moon, which, no, sorry, flower moon, then strawberry moon. You gotta get flowers first. Uh, the flower moon comes up in May, and then uh, June is, uh, the June moon is, is strawberries. And every year, strawberries show up. Um, so it's significant. Yeah, do I feel a little like I've been, yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, but again, I'm talking to people who live in Edinburgh. Uh, you know, the system that has been used to affect my people was perfected over there first. Um, and, and I know those stories and I understand resistance um, and what it means to hold on to those traditions. And again, renew them, like, which is why I love that first part of the conversation where I'm hearing you guys talk about that. Even the fact that you have that artifact, um, we're going through processes here of, of reclaiming our stuff <laughs> that is sitting in museums um, quite specifically in London, um, but even here in our own museums, right? You know, um, the, so the Royal Ontario Museum here in Toronto uh, created a policy um, several years ago where if you are an Indigenous person, you can go to the museum for free. Now, that's a big deal here because you got to pay to get into every university in, in Toronto. I know you don't have to in London, but you do here. Um, but it's significant because there's a recognition that all of those things they have in there, they're ours. Um, and, and there's been all sorts of efforts to reclaim people's bones. Like we got ancestors sitting in archives, like in, in, um, in Denmark, because somebody, somebody dug up a graveyard like that's, and the funny thing is they see it because it wasn't with tombstones as they call it archeology. span And it's kind of like, that guy probably is only in the ground for like 30, 40, 50 years. Imagine if I like went over and started digging up, you know, 200 year old graves in, in, in Scotland, like that person's relatives are probably still visiting. <laughs> so well, those are those with, with our incorporation of uh, candle makers, we're, we pride ourselves in being diverse and international. Mm -hmm. and yeah. just that the, the proxy of the sun fire is, is so relevant. And yes. hopefully by bringing us all together with yourself and your and yeah. teaching us that hopefully we can light that eat fire. Yeah. That is what I my hope. Um and our 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 motto is omnia manifesta loose, which means all things are, are made manifest by light. So I think that's what today's been. Yeah. And and so I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you two last things to think about. And then we'll probably shut her down because I know it's getting late for you guys. And um, I am taking up space in somebody else's school. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the first one is I would suggest as you're trying to kind of tap into some of these other teachings that exist in other places around fire. Um, and Sheila, maybe it would be a conversation with your sister or something like that. 
you folks have to have a time when you can sit with somebody who's Inuit, specifically an Inuit woman. So where I told you that within my traditions, fire keeping is a man's duty. Um, within Inuit tradition, um, there's this thing called a kulik. And a kulik is, um, it's the oil lamp that the Inuit use. And so they would heat their homes with this lamp, light the home, all those pieces, and it works off of oil. Uh, again, oil that's usually taken from um, Arctic animals, right? So it's, it's usually probably rendered blubber. Um, they have very specific teachings about the kulik. And, and I've, I got to hear a woman um, this year doing some of the teaching that she had with it. Again, it was just fascinating for me because she's talking about like, like there's stories they have about, you know, you're ready to, to get married if you can get the thing lit in a particular way, right? It's not about being able to cook. It's about, can you light this thing? Because this is how you're going to keep your family alive. Right. It's just such a cool tradition. So, yeah, like if we can get you in touch with somebody who's Inuit to do a cool week teaching and to talk about how that how important that is, is really cool. Um, and then the other piece, which is now just tapped out of my head. Um, oh, Kulik was about fire. The other one was ah, it'll come back some other day. Don't worry about it. Talk in the moment. But, yeah, I would totally get somebody to come in and talk about Kulik because um, I loved it. Like, again, I love learning from the other cultures around here. Uh, and even, even though, I mean, the Inuit, like it's a long way away from here, <laughs> but there are people down here in the city. And of course the beauty of the internet, right? You can get in touch with people anywhere. Um, so I love it. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. It's obviously something that we're, we're not aware of over here. And, um, you know, it's really, really interesting to, to hear you say all those things, a number of which obviously do resonate as, as you already identified with, with our thoughts and our philosophies as individuals and as an incorporated trade as well. Um, I would love to, to make you a gift of tobacco, but I suspect that um, various customs uh, yeah. Don't get in the way. <laughs> wouldn't allow it. So, so I'm afraid it'll just have to be a, a, a metaphorical gift. But you, Thank you. Have definitely brought our, our thanks for, for an absolutely excellent, very interesting talk. As I say, on an area that that we're not knowledgeable I, about at all. That's um, okay. You know, so so thank you for opening our eyes to us. I can, from where I'm sitting, I can see the, the book that you mentioned earlier on that uh, Sheila actually has a copy of. She's been more for mm -hmm. Yeah, but show us. <laughs> you know, so I, I've yeah. been sort of staring at the corner of my eye all the time, and you know, yeah. finding information from from other peoples, from other cultures, is always fascinating. Because anyone who thinks their culture, their people, are the people, right. you know, yeah. just so close mind to be unbelievable. So you know, thank you very much for your time, and and thank you You're very welcome. much for your talk and. Uh, you know, just a round of applause again, please. Uh huh. My pleasure. Uh, Mishomas, by the way, means grandfather. Just so you're aware, that's what it means. Um, and the stories in there, and there's a bunch of stories in there, and yeah, they're all important. But it's kind of neat to read. Um, and I would always suggest that when you're reading them, kind of do it with a map, so you can try and get an understanding of where these stories happen, because um, they're all important. The other one that I wanted to tell you, I, and this this one, this is really special when I get to talk to a Scottish crowd. Um, there's a there's a there's a bread over here that everybody thinks is traditionally um, indigenous, and everywhere you go, they talk about, oh, it's traditional, it's traditional, and it gets called bannock. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because nobody here knows where bannock burn is, um, <laughs> and, and it's really funny because it's made of flour baking soda and salt, which is soda bread. <laughs> but <laughs> and, and but everybody here thinks that it's ours. They refer to it as it's all oh, it's traditional made of food. And it's like eventually I have to sit somebody down and say, okay, we don't have flour. We don't do salt the way you do salt. And we definitely don't have baking soda. <laughs> and, they'll me, and they'll look at me and they'll go, but it's Bannock. It sounds native. I'm like, it's from Scotland. <laughs> and then and then they'll go, but then how come we think it's traditional? I said, well, because 
when we came to the trading post, what do you think we were looking for? The things and I just told you, Home Depot was out the window, right? <laughs> um, you know, so it's like, I'm only going to get flour, salt, sugar, baking soda, because everything else I got. In fact, I'm trading with you, like, you know, here's some fur. <laughs> You want beaver fur? Yeah, sure, no problem. It's a rodent. <laughs> so that's just something for you to kind of laugh at every now and again. Everybody here thinks Bannock is traditional. They think it's Mohawk or it's Ojibwe word. And I have to look at them and say, have you ever looked at a map? <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew.